morning. It's a uh, pleasure to uh, be here on the second day of our uh, legal policy uh, sector of QR48, and I'm happy to welcome into the audience the students from Computer Science One. Um, and, uh, and it's a particular honor to introduce my guest, but I'm going to, so I'm going to have a very abbreviated um, news item of the day, which you see up on the screen, which happens, just happens to be from this morning's Harvard Crimson. And it says, uh, because of my particular uh, attachment to Harvard, it was encouraging to see the Crimson take an interest in theft of music. And he goes on, and, and I just assumed because it was the Crimson we were going to have some pro information liberty posture, he says. But he goes on to say um, that the uh, suggests that college students still overwhelmingly get their music illegally. College students used to be the recording industry's best customers. They're now among the worst. You're all thieves out there. Um, and it goes on and on and ends with the call for uh, universities to be educational. Teaching students it's not okay to steal someone else's creative work is an important message to convey. Doing them requires more than boilerplate warnings not to infringe. We're supposed to lock anyone up there. I'm sure there's no one in bits. There may be some CS1 students, but there's no one in bits who would steal music, I'm sure. And Harvard should do more to challenge up the challenge. And then, of course, it turns out this is not an undergraduate. This is a graduate of the Harvard Law School who is the president of, guess what, the Recording Industry <laughs> Association of America. Anyway, there it is. It's worth a read. Uh, with that as the way of preface, uh, oh yes, the time stamper, sorry. With that by way of preface, I, um, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce uh, Marshall Learner, an intellectual property attorney for uh, nigh on to 40 years. Um, started off actually working as a patent examiner, and he's been practicing in uh, uh, most, uh, most of his career, I believe, in the area of Hollywood, California, a district which I understand has a particular affection for the field of intellectual property law. So thank you very much, Marshall, for being here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lewis. Uh, the purpose of copyright laws is to incentivize creativity. To achieve that goal, copyright laws provide some exclusivity as a reward for creativity. In order to benefit society, copyright laws must be administered to achieve the goals of incentivizing creativity without imposing an unreasonable restraint on competition and without imposing an unreasonable impediment on research and development. Uh, today I'll discuss uh, copyright uh, uh, laws, uh, copyright infringement, the fair use defense, and hopefully we can uh, uh, put it in the context of some current issues, particularly internet search engines. Uh, our copyright statutes are derived from uh, the constitutional clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, which authorizes the Congress to enact legislation to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Uh, the first copyright statute was enacted around 1790. Uh, at that time, the state of the art was the printing press, so our copyrightable sub uh, subject matter was, uh, the, uh, was written in graphic material, books, uh, some periodicals, uh, and uh, some newspapers. Uh, since then, the copyright statutes have uh, been amended to uh, uh, accommodate new technologies. There was a uh, major statute in 1909. Uh, Mark Twain uh, testified before the Congress and uh, was uh, uh, influential in, in that statute. Uh, and also in 1976, there was a statute uh, that uh, was almost uh, a major change in the copyright law. The Congress has finally come to understand that uh, we're in the digital age. Uh, copyrights protect an original work of authorship fixed on a tangible medium. In order for subject matter to be uh, copyrightable, it has to, number one, be original. Doesn't have to be good, doesn't have to be interesting, could be boring as long as it's original. 
Also, it has to be fixed on a tangible medium. When the first copyright statute was enacted, it was pretty obvious that uh, uh, what, uh, what was the tangible medium was the printing press. Today, it could be a computer chip. Today, we have the technology around us. Uh, you may not see the tangible medium or the, uh, uh, the bits on the tangible medium, but it's uh, fixed on a tangible medium. Um, uh, copyrights protect the expression of a work. That is, uh, uh, as opposed to what uh, some people refer to as the idea or the process or methods. Uh, some people say it's a, what you see is what you get. What you see, which is subject matter of copyrightable subject matter, is, uh, is there. It's the written and graphic material. Under no circumstances does it apply to uh, 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 processes or methods uh, recently, uh, there's been some uh, uh, patent protection available, provided uh, the tests of patentability are, are met. Uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, put the copyright law into a proper perspective, uh, let's look at uh, perhaps just some way to uh, observe it from the point of literal infringement. Uh, we know that uh, books and periodicals are uh, protectable. Shortly after the 1976 Act went into effect, there was a case uh, involving bits, which is, uh, of course, this course. I understand that some of you uh, may not necessarily be CS majors, but uh, I think you understand bits. It's a sequence of ones and zeros, which is uh, used to uh, uh, implement uh, the, uh, uh, the computer program. It's the object code uh, that goes into uh, the computer. It uh, makes it run, as opposed to uh, source code. Uh, one of the first cases after the statute was uh, enacted was uh, Apple Computer versus uh, uh, Franklin Computer. In that case, Franklin copied Apple's operating system verbatim. That is, it copied uh, all of the sequence of bits and, uh, and used them. Uh, one of the defenses that uh, Franklin asserted was, well, uh, a sequence of uh, bits, uh, ones and zeros, uh, no one really recognized them, un unless maybe you're a CS major at uh, Harvard. Uh, you just uh, program them uh, into a computer, and it's supposed to do something. It can go on. If you look at the printout, pages and pages, sometimes hundreds of pages. Uh, and besides, when it's in the computer, uh, you can't see it. Well, uh, the court held uh, for Apple uh, the mere fact that it's a sequence of bits, ones and zeros, doesn't detract from the fact that it's an original work of uh, authorship. Uh, it could be on a chip that's me uh, in characters measured in nanometers. It's fixed on a tangible medium. Uh, copyright uh, infringement is subject to uh, the fair use defense. And uh, uh, hopefully we can uh, spend uh, a little time uh, discussing it and some cases which uh, perhaps place it into context. Uh, fair use uh, is uh, the defense uh, was initially uh, uh, judge made. It was uh, codified in uh, the 1976 statute. Uh, the fair use defense relies on four factors. Uh, based on the statute, it's not necessary for the defendant who asserts the fair use defense to prove that all four factors are decided in favor of the defendant. Uh, but there are four factors with, in which the uh, court can rely on, which gives the court a certain amount of discretion. We'll see that uh, this uh, perhaps uh, places some uncertainty as to how the fair use defense is, is applied. Uh, factor number one is the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. Uh, if uh, the uh, use by uh, the defendant uh, is for uh, commercial nature, then that factor is interpreted in favor of the plaintiff, the copyright owner. If the use is uh, just uh, for a nonprofit educational institution, uh, that factor of favor is the defendant. Uh, for example, if someone were to uh, put a cartoon at uh, the end of a, uh, a lecture outline, uh, which is delivered in a nonprofit uh, educational institution, uh, that's a fair use, right? Uh, number two, the nature of the uh, copyrighted work. Uh, uh, the courts uh, tend to uh, hold that uh, if the uh, work uh, has more creativity, that factor tends to favor the plaintiff, the copyright owner. If there's less creativity, that factor tends to favor uh, the uh, defendant. Uh, 